What is going on, STR Nation? This is your brother from another mother, Emanuele Pani, here for another solo show as my brother Mike Shogren is at the Black Daily Hotel Con event. So we'll have him back next week and we'll get a little download of everything that went on. For those of you that don't know, Blake is launching his first event at his latest hotel. Uh, the event looks super cool. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it out there, but I'm sure when Mike comes back next week, I'll get us to uh, do a little download of everything that he went through, uh, learned any good kind of takeaways that we can all kind of benefit from. On this week's show, I had Bob LaChance with me. So he's a professional, ex-professional hockey player. And since he retired in 2004, um, he has had quite the real estate career. He has done over 2,000 successful transactions. Uh, his company flipped over 180 homes last year. And in addition to that, he has a VA company uh, that helps real estate professionals. He also has an investment firm. Uh, and so just overall, just a wealth of information. We talked about everything from his hockey career to his beginning in real estate to short sales, which is how he got started. Um, and also, we kind of dove into best practices when it comes to hiring BAs, how to find them, how to make them feel like family, how to make them feel like part of the team, um, which I think it's very important as you guys are growing and scaling your business. If you want to retain your VAs, you have to make them feel like they're part of the team, even if they are very, very, very far away from us. Uh, and lastly, a little thing that I really appreciate about the show, one of the questions that I asked him, if any big takeaways that he had from one of his hockey coaches um, and one of the things that he shared with me is one of the things that his coach used to say to him all the time which is the season is long and I think as you're starting your real estate investing career keeping that in mind it's never going to be quick um, the season is long even if the season starts off a little off it maybe starts off great just keeping yourself level-headed and not letting your accomplishments get to your head not letting your failures get to your head and just kind of staying stay in the course right so Regardless of how plan A is going or plan B, C, D, whatever plan you're on, staying on the goal, focusing on the goal. And now that is the most important kind of part of this game. And so just remember that the season is long. And so without further ado, I'm going to welcome Bob LaChance to the show. Hey, Bob, how are you? Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. It's my pleasure. So you have had quite an interesting life, have done quite a bit of things. Uh, so Walk me through your elevator pitch. Like, what, what's the story about and how you have ended up here with me today? All right. Well, it goes back a long way. So uh, without boring anybody, uh, I started uh, real estate back in 2004. That's when I retired from professional hockey. I played professional hockey for eight years. Um, and then instead of jumping into the corporate world or real world, um, I jumped into real estate. Um, and, I, and I know you probably might have a couple of questions on that, but I figured uh, real estate was the way to go. And right when I got into real estate, um, I thought I was a rehabber. So my first property that I jumped into was a rehab property. And then after that, I realized I had zero systems, zero processes, zero marketing. I didn't know anything. And then uh, I joined my local real estate investment association. And then I saw a speaker speak on pre-foreclosure. And at that now I went from rehabbing to a pre-foreclosure investor. You know, it was a shiny object syndrome back then. I didn't know what I didn't know. And so now I jumped into short sales and um, I did that for oof, a long time, probably did over 1,500 short sale transactions. And within that time, I also helped start a couple of real estate education programs and coaching programs. Um, and that went to oof, a long time until about COVID. Um, and within that, within that time as well, I started a virtual assistant company. I um, mean, also kept investing myself. So this is obviously a 20 year experience through, you know, everything from short term rentals to rehabs, to commercial, to single family, multifamily, et cetera. I love it. I, I relate to that a lot. I have done everything under the sun when it comes to, to real estate. Um, again, at the beginning, it was always because I didn't know what I didn't know. And there is so many ways to make money that you just kind of go to Especially when you go to real estate events and conferences, you're like, oh, that sounds awesome. I'll do that. And then like, oh, my God, that sounds amazing. I'll do that. 
I don't think we've ever had anybody on the show that did any kind of like short sales. For those of our listeners that don't know what that is, can you kind of explain what a short sale is and then explain if they're still here, if they're coming back, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, they're definitely still here. Um, we, we got about three of them into our office uh, up here in Connecticut. I have a real estate investment company here in, in, uh, in Connecticut um, while I actually run my, my virtual assistant company as well. Uh, but a short sale to answer your question, a short sale is when a property debt is higher than the value. So let's say the debt is $200,000, but the value is one ninety. The bank needs to take a short sale, which means they, they need to accept less than total due in order to liquidate that asset. So very, very simple um, definition. And I was doing that for a long, long time. Um, and the, the answer to your question is, are they still in play? Yes, they're coming back more and more and more. Um, like I said, we just had three come to our office uh, this past week. And so as an investor, why would you want that? And, and how do you, how, how do you get it? Like what, do you work with the banks? Where, what does that look like? Yeah, so there's, there's a list out there. You know, every state's a little different, but um, there's st different states that you could buy the list. And then what happens, what we do on the marketing side, we'll buy the list. Um, we'll either get them skip trace to find the best phone number or we'll send mail to them. And when the inbound lead comes in, then we'll convert them, obviously get them under contract. And then we'll do some due diligence, of course. We have to order uh, a payoff to the lender to see what the debt is. And then once we get that debt, We'll realize and we'll understand if the bank needs to take less for us to purchase the property. So short-term rental rentals, as an example, um, you know, obviously there's so many different tools and uh, out there that'll tell you exactly what rent should come in. So you'll know what you need to discount it down to to, to purchase it, right? So if the debt is 200 and you do you run all your numbers and need to buy it for 150, then you could come in with your offer at 150. So it's it's a very good way to acquire property. That type of list, which is a pre foreclosure list. Got it. So they're not quite in foreclosure, they're in pre-foreclosure, but again, in the way, it sounds like there is opportunity. And for those of us that are in short-term rentals, it could be a great way for you to buy something that is at market value or under market value in your experience. Do they typically end up being under market value in terms of what you're able to purchase them for? Oh yeah. Always obviously purchase some under market value. Um, you could buy them even, think about that. You could buy them at 90%. You could buy them at 80 cent, 80%. It all depends. And every deal is different. Every bank is different. So I'm not sitting here saying uh, it's an easy process. It's mm -hmm. a pain in the butt to do 100%. <laughs> I'm just being very, very straight with it. Very honest with everybody. We're uh, but there's other people. Yeah. There's people out there that will do it for you. If you get a, a, a short sale property or property that needs discounts, you know, there's some attorneys, there's some loss mitigators, they call them out there or short sale specialists. You could also find there's some agents that do it too. Awesome. Perfect. So you used to do that. Then it sounds like you've done a couple other things before we go into your VA company. And I'm curious to know quite a bit of things about that. I love your, the part of your story where you're a professional hockey player. How was that for you? And in my mind, athletes can be great business owners just because the level of discipline that you have and the level of like sacrifice that you've gotten used to over the years, in my mind, translates super well to growing a business. So kind of share with us what that experience was like. Yeah, you know, when you play any type of sport, um, you have to play as a team, right? You have to overcome adversity. You have a coach that's, um, you know, that's on you one day. You may love you one day, you may hate you the next day. You have to just learn how to deal with people and you have to overcome adversity. One, you know, one game you may uh, lose by a high margin and next game you may win by a high margin, but it's always resetting and not getting too high or too low. And it's overcoming uh, obstacles. That's a really, really big thing for athletes that I have found. You know, we have my office here in Connecticut. Um, we have majority athletes that work for us um, because they could... They could take, I mean, think about this real estate is a roller coaster ride, right? There's ups and downs, and you got to stay as even keel as you can, not get too high because real estate does have a lot of highs and not too low because real estate does have lows. It's there's always that roller coaster. So it's finding the individual type of or the type of individuals that can handle the emotional roller coaster. And athletes typically, um, I found, uh, can handle that pretty well. Amazing. And so, do you, what I find for myself, I was never a professional athlete, but I like to, to see myself as an athlete. I played professional, like sports growing up my entire life, and I continue to see myself as an athlete. 
So I continuously to train like an athlete. I like act like one. For your own personal journey, what has been the biggest lesson that maybe a coach shared with you that you actually find yourself either telling your team or it's a part of the philosophy that runs your life that you're still like, oh, I remember when coach B used to tell me, yeah. you know? Yep. This, uh, and, that, and that one, pretty much, that's a great question too. Um, I would say the season is long. What I mean by that is real estate is a long game, right? It's not how you start, it's how you finish. And you said it, you said it perfectly at the beginning that you've done so many different things in real estate. And, and I promise everybody that listens to this, where you start in real estate is not going to be where you end. Because if you think about it, you may start as a single family uh, rental person, and then you may buy a hotel, right? So you'll, you'll morph into different types of things. And when you start having accumulating a lot of cash, you may be a lender to some individuals that want to buy short-term rentals. So this is what happens. And I look at my trajectory. I flipped the house first. I rehabbed it. Then I jumped into short sales. Then I ran a coaching program. Then a light bulb went on while I was doing, you know, wholesaling, buying uh, commercial assets, et cetera. A light bulb went on and I said, hey, there is an opportunity out there because there's a huge need of trained virtual assistants. This is back in 2014. That turned me a different, a different angle. While I was lending, while I was buying assets and wholesaling and rehabbing and doing all that stuff. So it's pretty interesting. Um, you know, you'll fast forward today. I have a virtual assistant company with a little over a thousand VAs. And we last year we flipped over 180 properties. So, you know, two different types of business. I also have a lending arm as well. So there's a lot of stuff that you do today that, you know, I did not do back in 2004. Yeah. Love that. Um, the season is long. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So we, both Mike and I, um, which is my, the host of the show with me, I am pushing you not here today, but we are both big advocates for VAs for a simple reason that a lot of people that listen to our show want to get out of their nine to five, want to quit their W2s, whatever it is. And without VAs, you end up just buying yourself a job. And then where the VAs come in is they help you kind of buy back your time um, in a very, very valuable way. So there is companies like yours. There's tons of companies out there. I assume at the beginning. So first of all, where are your VAs from and how, how do you find them? How do you pick them? Yeah. So for me, all my virtual assistants are in the Philippines. Um, I've tried different countries, um, but I honed in on Philippines just because uh, they're all sort of majority of them. And what I find is that they are service oriented. You know, a lot of call centers are out there. So they're, you know, the way they grow up, they're very, very family and service oriented, which I like, which, you know, when you hire a virtual assistant, that's exactly what you want. Someone that feels like your business is their business and you're part of the family. So that for me is very, very important. Where I find them, we have a whole recruiting and sourcing team over in the Philippines. So I set, I, just to give you a little overview of how I set the business up, I have a sourcing recruiting team, then I have a training team, placements team operations and HR and accounting, et cetera, over there. So it's all set up uh, per department. A lot of like, same thing, how we run our businesses here in the United States is per department, uh, especially when your portfolio gets bigger. It's very, very important for all of us to look at our businesses in different part departments because they run different. But we have a whole sourcing and recruiting department over there. We have different areas that we go out and find. Um, we probably look at about a thousand applications a month. Um, we sift through them, we look them look at them, we talk to them, uh, we interview them, et cetera. Uh, so it's, it's pretty high level um, uh, department over there. Got it. So let's say that you, I am talking to you 2004, 2006, you, and I am, I'm like, look, Bob, like I've, I've seen you, you're doing a couple of great things. I think you would highly benefit from hiring a VA. Knowing what you know now, how would you go into those interview processes? Like, let's say you hire a company and they're like, we're going to give you five, six people to run through candidates and you're going to choose, right? What are some core questions that you have found with all the experience that you have are useful in kind of like understanding and sourcing good talent? And how would you run those interviews? Yeah. So for me, I mean, first and foremost, let me start kind of at the beginning and I would look at it and I would say, 
I want to know what I want first. So do you need someone in the short-term rental? Do you need someone to, you know, coordinate maintenance, coordinate cleaners, communicate with tenants, manage social media, acquisition? It all depends on what you want. So one of the things that I would listen to the first and foremost is I would listen to their accent and make sure that it's somebody that you want. Because we know all over the country is different. So um, for me, I do business in the South and in the North. So I do it really all over the place. So for me, I don't really hone in or care much about that. But if you need to do that, that's one of the things that I would do, right? And I would ask them questions. I always ask about their family. What does that look like? How long did you have your last job for? Because one of the things you do not want, very, very important, you do not, just like if you hire here, you do not want a job hopper, right? Because if they're hopping from job to job to job, then, you know, oh, I'm probably going to have them for a short period of time because they're always going to be looking for, you know, a cent more, 10 cents more, a dollar more somewhere else. So that is very, very, very important. So I would hone in first on those two things without getting into, you know, a whole, uh, the way we hire, et cetera. But those two are very, very key for, in my opinion, for what you're going to be looking for. So number one, look to see a little bit what their past is. And I would go over, what I do is I go over their resume. I say, walk me through a little bit of what your job was. And what you're going to want to do is find out if they're team players and find out if they work well with others and if they're coachable. Because, um, and, this is, and this is for here too. I mean, I was just hiring someone or I was just interviewing someone yesterday in office here. And the first thing we, we look at is coachability. We want to know how they're actually going to work with the other team members that are involved. And it could be just us, right? If I'm if I'm going back to 2004, I want to know if they could work well with me. So that is very very important. So those three things I would I would hone in on. Awesome. And so one of the things that you said earlier that is important and that is common in the Philippines is just people that are like family oriented. And then you said, I want them to feel like their business, uh, my business is theirs, and feel like they're part of the family. I love that concept and I think it's very important. And that's one of the things that I teach a lot to my team and also to like the people in our mastermind is like, hey, like the moment you make, because a lot of people, unfortunately, when they know that people are from the Philippines and they're VAs, they have this kind of overall attitude of treating people like they're less than, which I absolutely hate. Like I'm one of those people that if we're hanging out and we're at a restaurant and you're an asshole to the waiter, you and I are not going to have dinner very often because I can't stand yep. that. Like I am hospitality through and through in both in the way that I treat my my guests, but also in the way that I treat my team members yep. and anybody that takes care of me in any way, shape or form. I am grateful that this is what you're doing and that you do it with love and passion. So how do you make somebody that is hundreds of thousands of miles away from you feel like they're part of the family? So how do you how do you do that? Well, first of all, I feel the same exact way as you. I would not be eating with that person again because if they treat people like that, it's just, I don't like people that treat people poorly, right? So that's just, it's a, I mean, it's a probably a core value for you as it is for me on that side of it. And if somebody's working for you or with you, you got to treat them incredible. So what we do is we do daily huddles, start a day, end a day huddles, right? So we'll talk to the team. They listen, this is what we need to do. I'll send them messages. So you have Viber, you have Slack, you have WhatsApp. They can keep in touch with on a daily basis. I like keeping in touch with my team. So I'll get, you know, I also use Google Chat. I use a lot of different tools, Google Chat. There's always a, hey, good morning, boss, or hey, what's going on? How are you? And then I always get an expectation of what, because they already know what they need to do. Because when we you, we have our different types of teams, if it's on acquisition, because we want to buy properties, or if it's on disposition, or which means selling properties or getting things booked, uh, property management, there's a lot of different tasks there. I'm always in touch with them saying, hey, do you need anything? Do you need anything? We also have a what's called a client service manager, CSM, that manages the virtual assistant and the client. So they're another level that we could reach out to, um, which is very, very important. But we do huddles. Um, we do check-ins all the time. We have a weekly meeting that our virtual assistant is in that meeting, which I think is very, very important because think about this. Since COVID, uh, you know, remote work has been a very commonplace now. So it doesn't matter if someone is in the next town over. If they don't come in your office, 
It's just like they're in the Philippines or they're just like they're somewhere else. It doesn't matter. They're not coming to the office. They're remote. So I think for a lot of us, it's just changing our mindset and what remote work is, which means it doesn't matter if our team members are in a different country. So I think that's a, a mindset shift that a lot of us investors have been um, actually have gone through and started accepting. This is what I've seen. I mean, you may have experienced a little bit, it's a little different with your with your coaching students and your mastermind uh, students, but that's what I'm seeing. Yeah, no, no, and that's been along along the lines of what what we're seeing as well. Um, so, as a founder, right, and somebody that you have now so many different things going on, 180 homes, like flipping 180 homes, it's not it's not a small small task by any means, right? So, where where do you spend your time now? Like, what does that look like like what does bob's day look like now or your your week yep uh so in the morning time i spent a lot of time at virtual assistant company so i have meetings starting at eight o'clock and they probably end about 10 30 11 and then my team takes over from there because i have a sales team i have an operations team if i'm needed for anything like this jumping on a podcast i'll do it later on in the day but I typically like getting stuff done in the morning time for my virtual assistant company. And then the majority of the rest of the day is on my real estate company. And again, I can only do this because I have an incredible team. You said this before, if we're, you know, if, if we're doing all of this by ourselves, we are going to, we're going to burn out. It's just, it's impossible to work a full-time job, right? If, if you do work a full-time job, and being a, a full-time real estate investor. It's very, very difficult and you will burn out. So looking at these things and building your team the right way and implementing it, you know, a, a virtual assistant or even an employee, whatever it looks like into your business, I think is very important for anybody to either scale, become efficient or grow. Mm. Yeah, I love that answer. So where, where do you guys see, where do you see your company going? Because you've you've done 180 transactions in 2023. I know 2022 you did a, a little bit more, which probably makes sense just because of how the market was and just the time the times. Do you see that side of the business continuing continuing to scale? Do you see yourself just scaling back onto the real estate side and just full on VA side? What what does the future hold for you? That's a good question. Um... So I'll touch upon my real estate side first. Um, we are adding doors. We're adding new properties uh, every single month. So right now, I guess uh, I, we talked off camera. Um, I sold everything during COVID or right after COVID. So once the you know prices were extremely high, we sold everything, cashed out. So we had cash. Right now we're starting to buy. We're starting to purchase. Now we're in acquisition mode. And what we're gonna do? What we're gonna do on the flipping side is just stay stay even. If we could do the same amount as we did last year, I'm okay with it because we're going to start adding rentals and, 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 you know, markets come up and down as part of the game. It's, there's nothing wrong sometimes with not scaling and not growing, right? There's nothing wrong sometimes when you have a year where you are, you know, very consistent because this business, like we said, it's a long game. It's not a get rich quick, anything. It's just you know, working through the process and uh, looking to be consistent. So my virtual assistant company, I'm looking to grow that one, of course. Um, one of the things that I'm looking at is jumping into different types of industries, whether it's the financial industry, aside from real estate, of course. Um, there's some marketing companies we're talking to, medical side. There's other, we call them lines of businesses that we are going to be looking into going into 2025. Awesome. So as you're looking to scale your existing company, because that being able to diversify yourself within an industry is something that I like for vacation rental owners and investors as well, right? Because in my mind, if you have a successful property management business, that means that you can also have a successful construction business, design business, cleaning business if you want, maintenance business, and everything else, right? So as you grow your company, how, like... Because now you, you're getting to, like, it sounds like you're going to the next level, right? So as you're hiring that next level talent for you yourself, right, to grow it, how do you choose those people? Like, do you have a key hire that you're looking for now? Like, maybe like, oh, I need a CFO or I need a head of marketing. Like, how in the stage that you're in, who is that next player that you're looking for that you're like, oh, he or she is going to really, like, rocket fuel my business? And how, how do you pick them? How do you pick them? How do you find them? 
So if you're going to talk about, let's say, growing my virtual assistant company, it is really honing in on the marketing channel because if we don't have leads in any business, we don't have a business. There's no business to be had if there's no leads. So I think for all of us, we have to start with marketing and sales. So marketing and sales is the most important thing. I, I use that kind of loosely because if you have your systems, like you said, set up, if you have the property management behind the scenes set up where it's going to run no matter what, and you just add another product on it, like a, you know, a new property, if it's a vacation rental or a, you know, whatever kind of rental it is, you already have the platform built and the foundation built. And I know you guys coach on all this stuff, right? But if you have all of those in pieces uh, put together, you could do whatever you want. So for me, if I want to jump into a different industry like the financial industry, I marketing sales. And then on the, the back fulfillment side, I just get an expert in that area that creates the training and then hire the individuals to train, the trainers to train the virtual assistants. And then there you go. There's your system, there's your process, there's your new business. Got it. And so then it's your job to supervise how the training goes. Is your job to just set KPIs? What what do you look for there? Yeah, all that works, you know, kind of together because once you actually have your trainer, your expert that's in that field, they could train the right way because you have to create the training. It's the same thing with everything. You know, with your program is the same exact way. We create the outline of the training because if you actually let me take a spec, if you start at the end first, you know what the product is, right? The product, let's just hypothetically say it's, you know, you're looking for someone that's an expert in uh, coordinating maintenance with the cleaners, coordinating with tenants, you know, managing social media. You could create three different trainings, right? That could be for a week straight on all the, all the, the uh, nuances that go into those exact topics. And then what you do is you break down those trainings, you create the videos, you bring the trainers on that will then train the virtual assistants. Or it's the same thing in your office, right? If you want to you want to hire someone, it's the same kind of concept and how you build the training behind the scenes. And then you deliver it. And then once you actually go through a training, you have testing on it because you want to make sure that all of it's retained. I think that's a very important part that a lot of people miss is creating that testing after they go through you know, whatever video, because there's a lot of a video library and things like that. I mean, you're not going to retain it unless you you add testing in there and scoring and see how you actually um, end up doing on that particular module. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. And uh, one of the things that, that we talk about all the time as we, your onboarding team members is you're going to watch me do it. We're going to do it together. I'm going to watch you do it. And so that way, as you go through the thing, and I think you hit on a very important point when it comes to hiring VAs, because as you're elevating yourself past the nine to five into an operator and then eventually into a CEO, the majority of your time has to be spent in making sure that your team can deliver on whatever your, your deliverables are. And you can have the best training in the world with the best color coded and it looks amazing, but then if your VAs or your, your local team just doesn't either doesn't do it, doesn't understand it, doesn't implement it. I would just say, I would rather you have something on a napkin, but that gets executed on a hundred percent than something that right. is beautiful and fantastic. You put it on school and you're like, I have the best training in the world. All my SOPs are on here, but ain't nobody using it. So I'm just, <laughs> you know, you, you, you actually, you actually nailed it because you could have the best SOPs, but if you don't have any KPIs, you said at the beginning of our call, if you don't have any KPIs that measure what you do on a daily basis or what our VAs or what your employees do on a daily basis, then there's going to be things that do not get done because you don't measure it, right? It's very, very important. I'm glad you actually brought that up because that triggered kind of what, the, what one of the most important things are when you're training, you have the testing, but when you start, it's kind of like the old saying, live it, learn it, uh, give it. Right. Live it, learn it, give it or learn it, live it, give it. I should say learn it, live it, gift it because you can't gift it unless you actually or someone can't implement it unless you actually have some way to measure it. Hmm. Love that. Um, one of the questions that I like to ask to people, they're kind of kind of busy like yourself and, and feel like they have a lot of a lot of spinning plates is how do you cultivate balance in your life? Do you have balance? What does that look like? I mean. Balance is kind of a, a <laughs> uh, 
it's it's an it's a different answer for everybody. For me, yeah. I love just when I have a time when I have time off, I kind of like, all right, what do I need to do next? Like, I don't like. I think the more I do, the more balanced I am. It's kind of interesting because I have three kids as well, and they all play ice hockey. So I'm all over the place with them while I'm running a business. I have my phone on me all the time. For some people, um, they don't like that, but for me, you know, the the more stuff that goes on, the clearer I think. Mm. Love that. So once again, I want to be respectful of your of your time. Uh, if people want to learn more about you, your companies, your lending side, your VA side, where can they where can they find that? Just check out our website, Reva Global R E V A Global dot com. You can also send me an email, Bob at Reva Global dot com. We're also on all the social media sites, um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, etc. Awesome. So I really appreciate you having you on. The last question that we like to ask all of our guests. And we'll change it for you slightly. It's what's your number one secret to success in short-term rentals? So we'll change it to you. What's your number one secret to success with real estate? With real estate? Well, it would be the same same thing on short-term rentals. It's a long game. You got to start with one. Because I know you, know you have seasoned individuals and you also have uh, newer uh, individuals as well. You have to start with one. And you grow from there. If you don't start with one, you're never going to start. So I think it's very important in any, you know, whether it's, it's this or any business, it's, that's a, you know, common thing that, that we all look at. Awesome. Appreciate you having you on. Uh, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode and I'll see you next week. Ciao, guys. Hey, STR Nation. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. And in the comments, let us know what topics you want us to cover on upcoming episodes. And we'll make sure to get that in the books for you. And if you really want to learn how to launch, automate, and scale your short-term rental business, if you want to go deeper, then check out our free masterclass at strsecrets.com.